Uh, I was just um, invited to substitute for a previous faculty member, and um, I think it was the the involvement with chamber music, which which attracted me at first. And then as the program grew and the students uh, got more experience and more advanced, um, it was the process of teaching and coaching chamber music and being involved in their development that became really um, stimulating and gratifying for me. It's only string quartets. And so it's extremely focused. Um, and it's really dedicated to providing them with the skills to play chamber music, sp specifically quartets, which I believe is the most demanding genre there is for musicians. They're not only superb performers and musicians in their own right, but they also have a passion for teaching and passing on what they know. They're excellent communicators. They're experienced um, in performance and in the academic setting and in the festival setting. They're, they work well with others, and um, I, I, they're just wonderful people. That really didn't, you know, in fact, that's an interesting, it didn't impact me so much. It was really the, the program, I mean, the opportunity to, to teach and perform in a very intimate setting. And it turned, I later discovered how beautiful it was, and so I was drawn to it because of that. So it's, I, it's like poetry in that the art of the string quartet is a real distillation of the composer's art. And for, to in, be successful at integrating four individual voices to um, sound like a larger ensemble, to really fulfill the orchestral colors, of a bigger group is, is quite an art. And that's why um, the repertoire that we have at hand, the Beethoven Quartets, the Haydn Quartets, the Mozart, Brahms, Debussy, etc., these works represent the, the, the best works of these composers. Well, it's extremely complex. It's um, at once you are called upon to play your role, and you're the only one playing that voice. At the same time, you must always be, pay attention to blend, so you're kind of submitting yourself to the larger product. And I think that's really um, an art and a skill where you, you express yourself in the fullest way possible with respect to the composer's music. At the same time, you have to work in concert with three other powerful individuals and find a way so that you sound like one. So that's a, an enduring and ongoing dynamic of compromise and struggle finding the, the right balance or the times where one comes to the fore and the other one has to recede into the background. Um, we have a culture here where the music always comes first. And I think that culture is expressed by the faculty who understand that. It's um, conveyed by the camp. And our first rule is that um, you stay with the people you're with and you stay with the piece that you're with. In other words, you have to make a commitment. Um, and so ego, it always, it might bubble to the surface because ego, I, people say that, you know, it's not about ego, but if, People who really work hard to attain a high level have natural pride in what they do. And so it's really trying to um, join the, the four prideful voices together so that there's an overriding sense of accomplishment for the entire group. Not that one is crushed at the expense of another ego. No, no. but I, it's important, and I think this has been highly successful here, that the faculty and the students know that we're all humble before the music that we're trying to learn. It's very humbling and, a, and an, an incredible privilege. And as long as we keep that before us, it's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, well, now that we're having our fellowship programs for um, quartets that have established themselves or have put themselves together, that's you know evolving. And we do have, we've had, very successful quartets who form themselves. 
Um, however, the bulk of the camp is, uh, the groups are comprised by myself, and um, this is a, a process where I match them as closely as I can in terms of their, their development, their technical development, as well as their musical expressivity. And so um, I try to match them in terms in age groups, so I don't want a 15-year-old with an 18-year-old. And um, I rank them according to where they are in their technical accomplishment. And then I have, I have to trust my gut sense of what temperament might go with another temperament. So I want two people who are very, very expressive and maybe a hot temperament to be together. And, and people who are maybe cooler in temperament to be together so that um, they have a greater chance of being on the same page. Um, how many students come up here in a typical summer and where do you get them? How do you select them? How do you screen them? Uh, 48 is the number we accept every year. And that's 12 quartets, 12 complete quartets. They come from um, conservatories and schools, Ann Arbor, Cleveland, um, Texas, North Carolina, New York, from, from everywhere in this country. Um, they apply and they submit audition materials like a DVD or YouTube video. And I view them and I rank them as, as the, in the way I described before. So um, a lot of it is, is just my experience as a musician, sensing who will go with whom. So, uh, Friendship. Um, a, a ever developing love and awe of the music that they've had before them and that they have uh, uh, a sense of continuity that, and a sense of honor being a part of this being, and the value of what this process gives to them, discipline, commitment, endurance, um, a, a taste of the, the actual human experience as expressed in music. Um, but I think that the sense of the friendships that they make, I think they make really lasting friendships here because it's like being in the trenches. They work really, really hard. They watch each other's backs. They really get to know each other. So that's what I, I love seeing a lot is, is how bonded they become to each other and also that they develop good um, relationships with teachers. Well, I think that as we become more technology conscious, things are so fast. And um, I think even though it's, they, there's an emphasis on intuition, I think that the arts really give us grounding and traction in terms of being mindful of uh, what the human experience truly is. And I think with the, the way things are so speedy that um, our culture has put value into what is spectacular and marketable and, and maybe and, you know, extra facile rather than what is profound and what is lasting and what is substantive. So um, my drumbeat is always that classical music is always, um, is always the, exper the human experience itself rather than observing the human experience. So I think that this is why the students here always feel a profound connection to the music that they're studying. Well, hard work, basically. There's, there's um, the fundraising that has to go on all the time to provide the financial legs for this institution. And Tom George is responsible for that and is constantly working to make sure that um, it's financially viable. Um, there's the, the efforts of myself and Dale Dines to make sure that we're always getting students who are appropriate and uh, who will further the principles of this camp and embody the principles of this camp, and that's an ongoing search. And um, just the help of our staff, uh, Jonathan Cresha and our librarian and scheduler who make sure that things run smoothly and that organizationally it's consistent and well run. Any thoughts on that? Well, I don't think you, you don't need to sell this to young people. I think when young people listen to it, they get it. And uh, astonishingly, more and more uh, young people are playing instruments, the violin, the viola, the cello, and 
once you hear a Beethoven symphony, once you hear a Haydn symphony or, uh, you know, symphony by Mozart or all the incredible works out there, the music speaks for itself and it, it's just crass, but it, it, um, it connects to everybody. And so if, as long as they're exposed to it and there's no stigma, you know, superimposed by society about its place in society, then I think it's a natural attraction. Well, you can only play it when you, and, um, after you've spent many, many hours studying it and grasping the structure and the composer's intention. And what, it's like um, building a house. You have to look at the plans. And uh, the listener doesn't necessarily have the time to look at the plans and, and go through this house from the ground up, from the basement up. And it's, a, it's kind of a fleeting experience, just listening to a piece. Of, whereas in a performance, you, you really become familiar with every brick, with every nail, with every joist. And so you really uh, understand the structure of it and the lines of it, the arc of it, the life and, and the, the expression of it. How is there is? Well, I think the, the answer, it, there's a lot written in the score and some of the composers really did put down tempo markings according to the metronome. But the, those aren't always governing because sometimes they're not doable. And um, I think there is, I think everyone who is a responsible musician tries to do their best in conveying what the composer's intentions, but it's like anything, it's, it's ultimately fairly subjective. Um, but it, people have to still be committed to learning the score. I, just that it's been an incredible privilege for me to uh, serve as on the faculty and as music director, and it's helped me to grow uh, immensely in terms of my understanding of young people and about the musical process. And I just felt it's been a, a really fulfilling and rich experience for me here.